there's this little piece of paper and says no. and somebody says Boxer versus Raptor. Da, 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 da. joining us today. Yeah, hi. I don't know exactly what my, my capacity here will, will end up being, but at least the idea is to bring a, a layman's perspective to the table. Someone who can hopefully ask um, uh, sound questions at, at times where different, uh, different listeners might be asking those questions as well. Uh, but, and, and I hope, and another part of the reason I wanted to come here is to bring uh, a greater sort of accessibility to people who may might not be um, as well versed with socialism, with Marxism, um, who who might be on the fence, who might be curious, but want some issues addressed. And that that's actually the topic that we're going to go with with this episode, where where I want to bring a few like questions that I found. These are these are from the internet, and these are I think representative of what people either. Um, People who are curious, but, but they they feel that there's sort of a few barriers to entry, a few philosophical doors that are shut for them uh, from Marxism. And before we get into them, I want to, I mean, I think you kind of touched on this, mm -hmm. but I think it would be good to make clear that, um, I mean, I think Tony and I have been pretty upfront about the fact that we are Marxists and, and identify as such, or socialists, or whatever term you want to use. Yeah. And and Thad is not necessarily coming from that perspective. No. I, would, I would say you're someone sympathetic to the ideas and po possibly curious, but you don't identify in that way. Yeah, you know, I'm a socialist lover. And like, yeah, I, I have plenty <laughs> of socialists. Um, I can say bad things about socialists because I can always go, I have socialist friends. I can always pull that card. Mm -hmm. But no, no, um, absolutely. Like, I I am very curious and open, and I certainly... Politically, maybe I'm moderate. I'm probably very left-leaning in most ways. Basically, I've just never tried to gauge it, so I don't know. But what I see in socialism is a new way to look at the world and a new way to look at economics. And for me, that's always what it's been. It's been a real eye-opener because I can see that I don't... There's so many flaws, so many cracks in the armor of capitalism, and there are so many ways that that extends into our politics, into our day-to-day -day life, that you just don't notice unless you start thinking in a different framework. Capitalism is so pervasive, and then Marxism was my first way to, like, blink and, like, step out of that, take that, that you know... The I blue pill or the red pill? Oh, crap. <laughs> oh, God, I might have taken the wrong pill. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> I think red pill. Okay. <laughs> oh, yeah, definitely the red pill. If For it's, this, it's, if it's the red pill. Yeah. Oh, yeah, of course. Either way, it's the red pill. <laughs> <laughs> I, I love the fact that you mentioned how even if you don't identify as a socialist or a Marxist, you can use parts of the theory to help you understand the world. In fact, I mean, uh, th this it will be a could be a whole topic for a different time, but there are all sorts of even right wingers now who are former Marxists, and I'm sure hmm. are have a very good grasp on how the world works uh, because they are able to pull from Marxist theory when they need to. Yeah, the strategy and the theory of interpreting the world doesn't necessarily lead to the conclusion of the prescriptive part of it, right? Of mm -hmm. well. You know, you can understand what's happening and then say, that's wonderful. You know, you can understand surplus value and exploitation and all those things and then say, those are good things. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's, it's, uh, yep, depending on the, the hand it's in, you know, uh, a shovel can be a nice tool today, can brain someone, it, you know, it really depends. And that's, that's what I think about this too, is that there's so many, the world is really complicated, and there's a lot of things you can learn from a lot of places. And unfortunately, I think that socialism just has that stigma, and people just don't approach it. And so, yeah, I was just approaching it. It's been definitely valuable for me. Um, but yeah, so that's what I have. I have a few questions that I could just address to you guys, and you see what you think about them. And these are sort of, um, these are things I heard in college when I had my one Marxism class. These are um, specifically things that I found on the internet, though, at a few different sites, worldsocialism.org and socialism.com, or from where both these came. I don't know if it's okay to plug sites or whatever, Do if you guys care. Yeah, that's yeah, totally. fine. I mean, yeah. whatever. You know, World Socialism 
The there's a World Socialist uh, website that has a podcast daily. Have you heard theirs? No. No. It's basically news stuff. It's it's actually someone reading an article is what it is. Oh. Which so it's very different from us. If it, it in in my opinion, it feels red. I'm glad that they're putting something out there, but I kind of wish it was. Just uh, you know, um, felt a little bit more extemporaneous or something like that, or or perhaps if it were read by the author, that would also I think change it a little mm. bit. Anyway, they have, if you're looking yeah. for more socialist podcasts, you can check them out. If you don't, if if you like books on tape, I mm. guess it's very similar to that. Sure. It's just news articles being read, though. All right. So first question here, fellas. So this, and, and I also want to frame, just say real quick, like if you listen to this podcast regularly, this, and you want to talk to other people about it, these might be questions that uh, that are given to you, that are broached. So it might be, you know, another reason why it's good to listen to it. But the first question is: Isn't socialism what they had in Russia, China, or Cuba? Question mark. And the implication there being that wasn't that really bad? <laughs> yeah, right. I don't know if you want to start or what, where you are, how you want to handle this one. Um, I, I can sort of start. Um, yes and no. All right, moving uh, on. Like, <laughs> <laughs> yes and no. Yeah. Yes and no. Um, and maybe question mark. Oh, yes yeah. and no. Yes, no, maybe. <laughs> well, okay. Let let me let me take a crack at it first, and you can kind of jump in. The history of socialism is the history of critique of capitalism, and that's really where socialism begins with. Because you start with capitalism promised freedom and failed to deliver it. That's really, like, where Marx starts from. You know, he was a big fan of the French Revolution, which was a capitalist revolution promising freedom, equality, and brotherhood. Uh, but he found that it did not deliver on those things. So, like, moving from feudalism, from that kind of structure, it provides freedom from that? Or just, yeah. okay. Yeah, the, so it was an improvement, right? There, sure. there You were not necessarily, you didn't have all the awful, horrible things that came with feudalism, but it failed to deliver the society that it promised. And the, the question is, okay, what, why did it fail, and what do we need to change? So the first part, I mean, these are huge questions, right? So, mm -hmm. like, Marx actually spent most of his life trying to answer just the first question. Of why did it fail? And so he, he, like, if you read Capital, it's... How many pages is your copy of Capital, Tony? He's got it right here. Yeah, I always travel with it. Um, Pretty thick, yeah. Including the index, which doesn't really count. Uh, 1,141 for yeah. volume one. So it's like over a thousand page book, and that's just the first edition of many that were planned. He only ended up writing... Well, he finished that one in his lifetime, then yeah. two didn't come out till after he died. Yeah, and same thing with three. But anyway, I mean, there's a lot of work on yeah. explaining. In fact, if you take not just Marx, but people after Marx, you know, the people that have followed in the Marxist tradition, almost all of their work is explaining what capitalism is and why it's bad and why it fails to deliver the society that we all wish it would. Mm -hmm. So when the Soviet Union came about, people were still struggling with question number two. So they knew that capitalism was bad, and, and maybe they didn't even totally know why, but they found out that capitalism had two qualities that were peculiar to it. It had private ownership of the means of production, and it had a market system. And those, those were, the, and there's lots of other qualities of capitalism. Those are not the only two, but those were the two that were focused on, that were put forefront and central in the Russian Revolution. And so they said, we will not have private ownership of the means of production. And their answer to it, that was the part that I don't think was thought out super strongly, mm -hmm. was, well, we will have state ownership. That's that's different because the state is, is operated by many different people. Mm -hmm. And then instead of market distribution of labor and commodities and things like that, we will have planning. So we'll all, you know, whoever does the planning, sit down and figures it all out, and that's how everything gets distributed, is via planning. And there were wonderful things that came from that. I think that's what Tony is getting at when he says yes and no, right? Like, yeah. w women were actually able to vote sooner in the Soviet Union than in the United States. Ooh. They got the vote 
like right away. Yeah. Now, under Stalin, how much was the vote worth? Probably nothing, mm -hmm. right? But but at first, those first, especially the first few years, there's a lot of stories about what happened, um, and the, and there were wonderful things uh, that were completely opened up, made extremely str extremely free in the Soviet Union, in it especially shortly after the revolution, uh, before I, the Red Terror. Yeah, well, I think it's important, too, to mention with the creation of the Soviet Union that first you had the Tsar. Romanovs, I think, were about just over 300 years uh, in power before they finally were forced to abdicate uh, during World War I, partially because of World War I, but partially just because they were terrible people. And then you had a sort of coalition government between some of the members of the Duma, which was the formal legislator, but really didn't have any power. The Tsar had all the power over them. Some of the more left-wing, but non-socialist, or non-communist in this case, politicians, and some of the slightly more to the right socialists and social democrats, like the Mensheviks, uh, as opposed to the Bolsheviks, who were in power, but since they carried on with World War I, they quickly lost power, and the Bolsheviks, Lenin's faction, uh, was able to take a power in a relatively bloodless revolution. I don't, I don't think very, I don't even know if a dozen people actually were killed in their actual season of power. I, I think, talking about the Soviet Union, you gotta point out that they expected when the one domino fell of Russia that Probably Germany, maybe France, maybe England. Someone else or everyone else would suddenly have their own socialist revolutions. So they were going into this knowing that if they had a socialist revolution, they didn't have some of the things that Marx considered the preconditions, like being able to support their entire population, which mm -hmm. is a big bit of an issue. Nor did they seem to really anticipate that there was going to be a big backlash. I think from the readings I've done in Russian history, I think it's, I would say that the Bolsheviks probably had a majority support when they took power, even though they didn't take power in an election. Um, but there was the, a big civil war that just decimated everything in Russia. And I think then with no other countries, Germany tried and failed to have a revolution. And I think with that failing, that that sort of upset their plans for what they'd hoped to do because I didn't think, don't think they expected it to be so down low. Germany tried to have a socialist revolution? Yeah, well, oh. some of the people did. The, the Spartacus uh, revolution hmm. under uh, Rosa Luxemburg and your cat? Carl, yeah, yes, I have a cat named after Rosa Luxemburg, <laughs> awesome. actually. Um, and Carl, I want to say Liebknecht? Yeah. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, I don't know if you're pronouncing it right. No, I'm yeah, sure I'm not pronouncing it right. Picked, yeah. So they tried to have a rebellion which was quashed by their own social democratic party. Ooh, ouch. Uh, who then murdered the two of them and threw their bodies into a river. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It was... <sighs> All's well that ends well. Th this might be a controversial stance I'm going to take. Maybe you disagree with me on this. But I think the things that you're pointing out are basically that... Russia's revolution did not follow the standard Marxist plan. To the extent that Marx came up with a plan, he said that socialism would happen first in a highly advanced capitalist country. And and yeah. Russia was not that. It was it was largely feudal at the time and and certainly not advanced by any measure compared to uh uh Europe and and the US. And and so and also part of the theory, of course, was once they did it, then an advanced country would do it, and they'd they'd exchange. And I think that can be comforting to look back and say, well, that's the reason why. But I'm not I'm not so convinced that that was really the reason why, because I think still, even if it had happened in Western Europe, there may have been the problem that they would have tried the Soviet the same Soviet strategy. Or, or what ended up being the Soviet strategy. Well, I guess what I'm saying is that I, I don't think those necessarily needed to be there, but I think because of that, it helped set the stage for someone like Stalin to step in. Mm -hmm. Is that That's no, the I, point I'm getting at, so I agree. projecting to where we're going. 
I agree. with the other countries and how that panned out. Yeah, so um, I, I don't know how much our listeners know about Soviet history. Probably actually some of them a ton, because <laughs> you probably have some like very intelligent Marxists listening. And others that are just interested don't know anything about it. The the widely agreed upon thing amongst the vast majority of socialists, there's a couple of Stalinists still holding out somewhere, I'm sure. <laughs> but but for the most part, socialists uh, do not like Stalin, regard him as a traitor and, and someone who ruined the Soviet Union. And, uh, you know, basically everyone hates Stalin. That's the thing. Sure. No, but <laughs> I mean, effectively, he's just a fascist, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, in many ways. I think w- one of the problems was that with the Soviet Union, their assumption was that state ownership meant ownership by the proletariat. But in, in reality, what it meant was ownership by the inner party members. Mm-hmm. And so there was your big disconnect. Like, if you define socialism in a completely different way, one that I think is a better way to define it is that the workers, the people who produce value, own the means of production or, or more importantly, own the distribution of the output. They, they are the people that get to decide the distribution of the output. If you apply that standard to the Soviet Union, was it socialism? In absolutely no way. In fact, a, what a lot of socialists call the Soviet Union is, quote-unquote, state capitalism. Mm. Because capitalism is not defined by the presence or absence of markets. It does seem to correlate fairly strongly that okay. in capitalism you tend to have more market distribution and in non-capitalism you tend to have less. But every system of economy has had markets to a greater or lesser extent. Mm-hmm. You know, the ancient Greeks, you can actually read like what Aristotle wrote about markets. So markets are not a new thing with capitalism. Uh, however, you know, they are correlated with it. So the fact that you get rid of a market doesn't necessarily mean you've gotten rid of capitalism. You know, what does, how do you define capitalism? It's that so, uh, one group of people work for a wage and another group of people get to decide what to do with the output from those people and whether it's sell it on a market or plan the distribution of it amongst yourselves that's it's still capitalism one way or the other so it was it, they still had a, a centralized power and a ruling class essentially yeah and and that i mean a ruling class probably it's easier to corrupt that than everybody owning the value of their work right i would assume yeah well i mean i think that it's basically a truism that the ruling class was corrupt. But I actually take the stance that any ruling class is corrupt, mm-hmm. right? Like, the extent to which you give somebody power is the de- is almost always the extent to which they abuse that power, especially if we're talking about, in a historical perspective, evaluating the entire si- system. Mm-hmm. Like, you can have some rulers that abuse it a little bit less or a little bit more, but in general, that's kind of how it works. And so the idea would be if the people that produce that value are the ones that get to distribute that value, then you've distributed power Uh more equally, that you've set up a system where for the, at least the first time since slavery was invented, the, the people that are producing the values in society are also those that get to contribute to the distribution of them. And that, I mean, that's, that's my basic take on the Soviet Union. You know what? I'm, I'm actually going to go out and say that for many reasons, it was good that it happened. Like, obviously, Stalin was awful and needed to get rid of. It needed to end. But it also needed to happen for a few reasons. One, people needed to figure out what really are the important characteristics of capitalism. Like, if you don't like capitalism, you can list all the characteristics of it. You can make a very long list of everything about it. But if you don't know which ones are the important ones, you're never going to be able to go beyond capitalism. And I think that was the fault of the Soviet Union. Uh, or that's what happened in the Soviet Union. And and it also means that now, once you've figured out what those characteristics are, you need to not, then you understand where you can start building an alternative to that. Mm-hmm. And and I think that's something that socialists, especially since the fall of the Soviet Union, you know, I mean, there were lots of people that started thinking about this immediately after the Soviet Union was created. 
but I think it was, the whole Cold War and everything was too much of a distraction. There were too many people that really weren't able to focus on the question because they were caught up on whether or not you were for or against the Soviet Union. I mean, my stance on it is the Soviet Union was a failed experiment. Mm -hmm. And and actually, probably a lot of people would agree with that, even capitalists. But they would they would say that the therefore there is no answer. You know, that's the capitalist stance: is the Soviet Union failed? Therefore, there is no alternative. Society will always be capitalist from now till the end of time. Mm -hmm. Forget the fact that we've gone through many different transformations of different social systems. <laughs> this is the one that will last forever. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah, you can have no missteps. That's yeah. why if if a baby is crawling and he starts to walk and he he stumbles that first time, don't he'll never he'll never walk. <laughs> He's crawling forever. Yeah, yeah, I I have a three year old that can attest to this. He uh, yeah. we have to carry him everywhere now. He, did, uh, did you notice sure, I crawled in here today? Yeah, I did actually. I was going to ask. I tripped you about one time. That. I tripped one time. <laughs> Uh, okay, so that that makes a lot of sense to me. Uh, I mean, that just the whole idea that you still had the these very corruptible influence here, the, the, this ruling class, and it wasn't true uh, socialism in practice or Marxism. Mm -hmm. When you it, can you extend that to China and Cuba? Is that is it a similar story there? I think they largely well with the setup of the third international. Basically, everyone was forced to line up behind Stalin. And I don't really know, This is my history is lacking a bit here, so I don't really know about the Sino-Soviet split. I don't know, uh, Red, if you know a lot about that, other than no. there was obviously a tiff between them. Sino being, is that China then? Yeah. Okay. And actually we should talk about China as it is today, technically according to them, a communist country run by the Communist Party, mm -hmm. but they, interestingly, have gone... I'd say almost full circle and under, um, I'm gonna pronounce this wrong, name wrong as well. Ding Zeng Xiaoping, I believe, started introducing markets and neoliberal reforms and opening up to foreign investors. And so basically, they're more, I would say, closer to a cap, much closer to a capitalist power at this point than they are to like the old Soviet powers. Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. they still they still have the one partyism and they still have tight control over things, mm -hmm. but they've let privatization really take over a lot of the stuff. So it's like they basically have the Soviet style or the Stalinist style authoritarianism combined with sort of the extreme right wing neoliberalism, which I think is a scary combination because uh, yeah. as a uh, as Zizek pointed out in his book, First is Tragedy, Then is Farce, which I just read, he uh, isn't sure that you can necessarily say that capitalism and democracy are really linked together, mm -hmm. and that perhaps this capitalism with, I think as he called it, Asian values, mm -hmm. referring to China. That's not his term. That's that's what the that's what Chinese the Chinese oh, is leaders that they, call it. Okay, yeah. okay, that's what the mm -hmm. Chinese. Are. Okay, interesting. Yeah, so I guess what the Chinese do, he's worried might actually be beneficial to capitalists as being mm -hmm. more efficient for them, mm -hmm, as yeah. they're able through terror and fear and shock doctrine stuff to be able to extract more from the working class. So I'd say China is even more weird and complicated nowadays. But before Mao's death, they would largely lump them together with the Soviet Union. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. I would. I, the only thing that I would say is it's interesting to see the the different paths that they took because in many ways they ended up in the same place, right? Yeah. Like they now are both places with highly corrupt governments, the with with a capitalist economy, basically. Mm -hmm. But the Soviet Union did it because basically they fell apart. Like their population wouldn't put up with it anymore when they found out actually how good the standard of living was in the West. There was a lot of propaganda about how awful it was in the U.S. And so they could, they couldn't sustain their society anymore because uh, of upset among the populace and things like that. So they kind of fell apart and they rebuilt it up and lo and behold, it was largely the same groups of people that are now capitalists and, and heads of state in a capitalist way, but are, are even much more wealthy. It's actually a lot easier to justify wealth. No matter how, you know, if you're a corrupt capitalist versus a corrupt socialist, it's still easier to justify your extreme wealth as a corrupt capitalist. It would be really interesting, actually, to look up the differences in wealth in the Soviet Union 
even when they were, you know, when even when you had Stalin and all of those things. Because I think that the fact that their doctrine was socialism may have prevented them from getting as wealthy as the plutocrats mm. in the West. But whether or not they did, I mean, there's awful for other reasons, too. Like, the fact that people were spying on you and listening to you. Not unlike today, but, you know, whatever. Yeah. That was a whole, that's a whole different conversation. <laughs> but, the, but they went different paths, because Russia fell apart and then started over as, as capitalist. And China, the leaderships remained intact, and they decided to become capitalist. And actually, yeah, I've, uh, Zizek points out uh, in some of his lectures and things like that, that the ruling class, the inner party in China, justifies it via Marxism even. They say, because we need to develop the means of production to a particular level in order to have socialism, the best way to do that is by having capitalism first, which is wonderful that they've used Marx to justify capitalism. Mm -hmm. But, but yeah, I agree with you that another thing that, that Zizek says is, capitalism with Asian values, he says, oh yeah, we tried that once in the West. We called it fascism. We had a different <laughs> word for it. <laughs> yeah. It seems like that's part yeah. of the issue here is that there's no there's no name police and you can call yourself socialism and do whatever you want. Mm -hmm. And then and that and then the stigma lives on. Yeah. Yeah. With the it, name. Although um I'm not sure that you know, I think that there's there's one way to address the Soviet Union as saying they called themselves socialist when they knew darn well that they weren't socialist. Mm. And I think that's partially true, but this is going to be ridiculous to put a number on it, but I feel like it's like 30-40% true, maybe 20%, somewhere around there, or I should say maybe even more than that. It, I feel like there probably were a lot of people, because of the way socialism was defined, thought yes, this in fact is socialism. Now, Lenin was not one of them. You know, Lenin actually used the term state capitalism. That's where a theorist after him came up with that to call the Soviet Union that. I don't know that he meant to create a whole other like, societal category by calling it state capitalism. Before Lenin, before the revolution, uh, well, first of all, let, let's talk about the revolution. There, were, there was a slogan that Lenin had, that the Bolsheviks had, to win the majority of the people's support. Do you remember what it was? It was peace, bread, and land. Because oh, they wanted to get that. rid of uh, World War I. They wanted to have bread. And land, because most of the people in Russia did not own any land. Mm -hmm. They did not have basically any private property. And who was the first person that introduced the ownership of private property to the vast majority of people in Russia? It was Vladimir Lenin. <laughs> That's who did, because he it actually gave pieces of land to farmers. Yeah. I mean, he, he essentially introduced private ownership of land, or at least to the majority of people. It was, quote unquote, you know, privately held by, you know, landlords and, and, you know, the old feudal aristocracy before that, but most people had nothing. Mm -hmm. Which is a fun, like, irony of the yeah. whole situation. But I think it was because of things like that that Lenin said, look, we, we can't, you know, socialism is our goal, but we aren't there yet. You can only keep saying we're not there yet for so long before people get upset. So I think that's part of the reason why Stalin said, okay, we're there now. Right. Well, that's the problem, though, is that when they, when they finally were there, they didn't change anything like they should like they were supposed to once they went okay we have houses we have food we have goods they went all right let's keep on it <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> then is cuba a product of the cold war is that was that kind of swept into had to choose sides i mean i i don't know too much about the history of it so yeah cuba was much much later well and actually china was pretty late too was oh, so russia was 1917 China was like in the 40s? Yeah, I want to say late 40s, um, after World War II. Oh, okay. And Cuba was what, 59 or 60s or something? Yeah, late 50s, I think, yeah. So it was, it was by far the, the latecomer. The Cold War had been a thing for quite a while. But I, th I think socialism had great appeal in Latin America and actually retained its reputation even with its proximity to the U.S. during the Cold War. Mm -hmm. Probably because the U.S. had not been uh, very nice to the to Latin America mm -hmm. the years leading up to it. And we still aren't. <laughs> and actually, along those same lines, like if you look at certain 
socialist or communist groups in the U.S., like the Revolutionary Communist Party. Their leader is Bob Avakian, and you can... They're, they're a little... They're pretty old-school socialists when it comes down to it. Their group is largely African-Americans. And I think it's because it, in the Black Panthers, we're all Marxists. If you read oh. their stuff, actually. Like, if you read, like, their 10-point their platform, it's straight-up Marxist theory for the most part. Okay. Um, you know, they talk about taking over the means of production to have, you know, to be able to provide jobs for, for people in their own communities and things like that. I think it's because... If the system you live in treats you poorly, you have a greater incentive to look for alternatives. Mm -hmm. And I, so I think in Latin America and, and even amongst African Americans in the U.S., that was, that was the story. That's why they ended up having a more favorable view of socialism or Marxism and working towards it more. So I think that's part of the situation. I think Cuba is, is an interesting society because i i don't know that like the the spying and all of the the awful state things ever got as bad in cuba like no, i don't that, think so there are certain freedoms like that i i don't think their free speech is as loose as, as what we have in the u.s and things like that and they've got a lot of state-owned media and i'm not saying that there's no problems there but i don't think you they're, we can say that they're just the exact same story as, as the Soviet Union. Mm -hmm. and, and they do a lot of, even today, they still like send a lot of doctors places where they're needed and, and things like oh, that. Yeah. They, well, they have a huge, I don't know the numbers off the top of my head, but the doctors per capita in Cuba, because they have such good state education, is just ridiculous. Like They have the best doctors in the world. I think it's like they have enough doctors that everybody gets like a house call like once a month or something. Hmm. Just because they have so many. <laughs> Do you think that goes back to Che? Because wasn't he like he a, doctor, a doctor by yep. training? Yep. Yeah, he was a doctor. Hmm. Um, possibly. He d I don't think he really hung out in Cuba too much after the revolution, though, because I think he wanted to go no, fight but, revolution in but, Libya. But having him as a as a image of the revolution and the creator you know like yeah, this in icon. many ways similar to George Washington here or whatever yeah yeah so do you think historically it, i've always had the sense that socialism is used as a smoke screen to to manipulate and control people but the way you make it sound in russia is that it actually i mean they had kind of pure intentions leading into it like they 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 had the revolution they really wanted to create that they want to give this a shot like even the leaders at the time wanted to, and then what the sort of the corruption came later as a consequence of a poor setup. I think so. Well, I mean, I think Lenin certainly wanted to have socialism. I mean, he he had a traumatic uh, childhood. His brother was executed by the Tsar, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, like he sucks. He um he clearly had. You know, not to, to psychoanalyze him, to, you know, because some people want to reduce Lenin to purely just that. Like, oh, mm -hmm. yeah, he was damaged goods, and so, of course, he was awful from the beginning. I don't think that's the case, but I, I think providing a good life for people was something that was clearly on his mind and something that really did matter to him. Same, you know, I don't know what Trotsky's biography is, but uh, I feel like Trotsky was, was similar, and he was... a an important person in the Bolshevik party. And you can see in his writings critiquing Stalin. Maybe he just wrote all that criti like, you know, like he writes very good socialist critique of Stalin. Mm -hmm. like if you want to read a good socialist critique of Stalin, get uh, The Revolution Betrayed by Leon Trotsky. That's a great one. It sounds like writing that's a good way to get assassinated in Mexico. Mm, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but and, and maybe you could say that he was critical of Stalin just because he wasn't the leader and so you know you got to find a way to be critical but if you read his stuff it's I think that he actually believes in socialism mm. and is even in the text it's very plain to see that he's very upset with Stalin for having corrupted mm. what should be a wonderful thing when it comes to Stalin did he have the right intentions no I mean who, yeah who, <laughs> I'm just gonna but, say no yeah, yeah look at that mustache no maybe way. in 1917 like I know nothing about Stalin pre coming to power. Okay. Yeah. The um, only thing I know is that he helped smuggle in, I think, the Erkska or whatever Lenin's paper was. And I don't think he really even played much of a role in the actual revolution itself. He managed to worm his way up somehow. 
The sad thing is that it is so appealing to disenfranchised uh, people uh, in very impoverished populations. It's such an appealing notion, and then they're the ones that in in these um, examples we're talking about that got just screwed. It's it's sad, um, but. Well, I don't want to say that like it was the worst thing in the world that ever happened to them either, because the fact that you actually get to own some land or mm-hmm. that you have like an apartment with running water, like these are all things like the Soviet Union did improve the standard of living mm-hmm. for Russians in a great way. Yeah. You know, they did things that they could have never had done if they were small scale capitalists place. Like very simply put, the farmers were too poor to buy a tractor. Oh, yeah. But you know what's what the Soviet government could do? They could make a tractor factory and just start handing out tractors to make their farmers more productive, whether or not they could afford it. Or, you know, if, if it was capitalism, you'd have to wait for those people to, like, save up enough money, which maybe they never would be able to in their lifetime, to mm-hmm. buy a tractor. But... Because you're just the Soviet government, now you can plan things. You can just start being like, okay, it, you know, we're not going to have to wait for that anymore. We, we've got the people to do it. We can build a factory. Boom, let's go. Mm-hmm. And so they were able, I mean, the actually, Trotsky's book, The Revolution Betrayed, begins with all of the advances they've had. And, and the pace at which they caught up to the West, because I remember they were coming from basically a feudal society, was amazing. Mm-hmm. They, they caught up amazing you know compared to other third world nations they you know, they went from the third world to the second world it was the socialism was the way to do it mm-hmm. and the people that didn't do it remained in the third world there were a lot of things wrong with it but when you look at whether or not they made the right choice given their previous circumstances i mean the, yeah. i think there's an argument to be made there that they they did well with what their choices were. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I'm listening to, um, as I'm commuting to school, The Family Romanoff. And yeah, life under the Tsar was not good. Like they were talking about peasant women had a saying when a baby died, was, oh, God thought better of that poor decision to let that child be born. Mm-hmm. And like a folk songs about how, oh, there's a guy down the road who's neither poor nor rich and he feeds his kids hay. I'm not going to treat you that well. Like, yeah. It was, everybody was starving, and the Tsar was brutally repressive, so not that Stalin was not brutally repressive, but it's also sort of like Cuba when people talk about how the communist regime there can be repressive. Batista, who the United States helped put in, was just awful. Yeah, it's easy to say that, oh, Stalin was was just as bad or worse, but at the time, they, they weren't planning on having that happen. At the time, there was an improvement, and they got them out of that... And, yeah, so that's interesting to to keep in mind. I didn't realize that. This episode is part of the Marxism Today podcast series. Marxism Today is recorded, mixed, edited, produced, and maintained by Tony Schmidt and Red Wagner. It is distributed freely and licensed under the Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial Sharealike 3.0 license. To find out more about the Marxism Today podcast, visit our website at marxismtodaypodcast.wordpress.com, where you can find archives of all of our episodes available for download. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time.